Good morning, everybody. The main parts of the flow in the atmosphere this week are kind of boiling down to three different things. We're watching a ridge build in the west, which we've been talking about. This is going to bring quite a bit of heat into California, Oregon, Washington. We've watched systems like the one we just saw here over the last couple of days slide right down the spine of the Rocky Mountains. And we've seen this system deliver quite a bit of rainfall and some snow into parts of Colorado. But this section of Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, we're going to watch this system continue its way up toward the east coast. And what it's getting pulled around is the base of a broader trough that is still sitting and spinning uh, over the Great Lakes and parts of Ontario and Quebec. And that's kind of the third piece to this flow, which is what's keeping so much of this part of the country colder. But as we've been watching the storms kind of form with this system that's been rolling right down through this area, uh, we've seen some just incredibly large hail that's fallen out of this. Looking at just the storm reports here from yesterday, again, 141 different reports, but the vast majority of them have been hail. Some of this has been very, very large hail. I'm sure you've seen some of the size of that hail on news reports and on social media. But it's not only been in parts of Texas, we've hit parts of the southeast, including Georgia and Florida, with some large hail as well. So I, I have a little <clears throat> algorithm that processes a data set called the MRMS data. And they have something called the maximum estimated hail size. And so I use this to generate hail reports. And I just made a map of the last three days just to show you kind of the, I don't know if you want to call them hail scars across the United States. So it's kind of followed the trajectory around the base of that broader trough here. But it's uh, in Texas. I mean, you just see here some of these colors um, that get up here into these brighter shades. I mean, that represents hail that's bigger than two, some of it up to five inches in diameter. And I just want to note here that it also includes places and parts of the southeast. Look at the streaks coming through Georgia and then, of course, in Florida. I'm sure you've seen some of the pictures here. There's the hail piling up in Florida. It kind of looks like it snowed. Just incredible to see that. Well, thinking about the severe weather side of this, I want to remind you that where we currently sit this year on hail reports is almost right on trend. And once we get the data from yesterday in here, I'm sure this is going to bump up once again. It was interesting to kind of look at this, though, because we have two different groupings of hail reports over the last 15 years. We have a grouping that kind of pops up like this and a second grouping that stays down here. And for the last few years, we've had below normal hail reports. You've got to go back to 2020 uh, to, to, until we saw some above average. So here we are sitting right about the mean, and we're going to see how the rest of the season kind of plays out because as I've been making a case, once we get into the month of May, I think we're going to see quite a bit of um, a severe weather activity. While we're here, I do want to show you that tornado reports are well above the climatological average here, way above it actually, only two years uh, having more tornado reports than the current year. And in terms of wind, we're also up there pretty high, only three years having more wind reports through this part of the season. The satellite data from yesterday, just as I was kind of watching the sun rise here today, really kind of shows us where these big storms were too. So here's that low curling up, a lot of cloud cover over parts of the south. But you just notice here, deep convection coming into this part of Texas. And you can also see it over here in Florida. In fact, I'd like to zoom in and just show it to you. Because <clears throat> not only can we see just these massive storms, each of these supercells kind of raining into the one ahead of it on this sagging boundary. But take note on the back side. There was yet another dust storm that came through parts of, uh, of Texas, just revealing some of the ongoing drought issues that are um, in Texas. And later on this morning, about a couple hours from when I'm recording this, we will get a new drought monitor that will be important to have a look at. And again, over in Florida, I just want to show you a lot of these were blowing up on the sea breeze. And just see the sheer size of these storms and the wind shear on top of them blowing the tops off. And uh, just important to kind of get, kind of capture this early in the season so that we understand Maybe how this season is going to evolve with El Nino. That's going to be top of mind for me. All right, what are we thinking in terms of severe weather? Well, today uh, we do have the Gulf Coast in this part of Florida. We're going to be watching very carefully, but we could see thunderstorms over broader sectors here of the United States. But what I want to get to is tomorrow. So here's on Friday because we noticed that the Storm Prediction Center has now increased to this area back into an enhanced risk in and around Dallas. And when you break it down by severe weather type, 5% around tornado, 15% on, on um, wind, but you see the hail probabilities are once again, once again very, very high. So we need to be keeping a very close eye on, uh, on this situation. And the next big story is this heat that's building into the west over the next several days. We're going to see temperatures really climbing up here deep into the 90s, and the warmth will then spread throughout the Intermountain West while we still hang on to cooler conditions. This is a 10-day average temperature anomaly map, and this map's going to be changing a lot over the coming days, but one of the big things we stressed earlier this week is we know how much snow is still sitting in the Sierra Nevada, right? There's 50 to over 100 inches of liquid, and as it begins to melt, 
starting to get very concerned about what the flooding threat is going to look like. Also, we need to be thinking about avalanche issues uh, up at the higher elevations. And, uh, but we're going to get a lot of snowmelt out of this. And I mentioned this yesterday, but I just want to bring it back up again. This is using some Sentinel data. We're down here in the San Joaquin Valley, so this is highly agriculturally productive area. So Fresno, just maybe a, for those of you that aren't in the California area, that's a big city you would know, or Bakersfield. And in between, this has been an area that's been discussed quite a bit. So this is a falsely colored image so that I can see the water better. And what I want you to note is this is the, 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 the Tulare Basin, and this is an area where we've seen flooding. All of this and through here, these are all farm fields that have been flooded. Now this map I've been showing you, this was back on the 27th of March. What I want to show you is how much more flooding has happened since then. So when I flip this over, this is the latest data, we now see um, just a tremendous amount of land area here that is underwater. And this has been a, an incredibly stressful situation for this, like I said, highly productive agricultural region. But I just wanted to show you from satellite a few of the things that we're watching here. Okay, since we're talking about water, let's kind of broaden this out and think about bigger picture things. There's a lot of folks in the Central Plains, parts of the Midwest, that have been very, very dry. Same for this corner of the Dakotas and Montana. In the Southern Plains, excuse me, in the Southwest, this region has been exceptionally dry compared to average as well. We have yet to really deliver quite a bit of moisture into this region. And again, I'll talk about this tonight, but this is an area that I'm concerned about going through summer, Arizona, New Mexico, um, West Texas with the lack of a strong monsoon season possibly of just staying hotter and drier. One area that we'll see some correction on this will be this region here in the northeast and mid-Atlantic. We're going to see quite a bit of moisture coming through uh, here in the coming days. But expect this hole uh, to get a bit redder as we go forward because over the next 10 days, that deeper trough over the east, there's a lot of convergent flow on the back side. So we're going to see a lot of sunshine, highly volatile soil temperatures. What I mean by that is they're going to be very cold in the morning in the 30s and 40s, and then they're going to jump way up in the afternoon as the sun beats down on that bare soil. But over the next 10 days, this is a drier area. Now, the two things I'm watching in addition to this is over here. There's troughs redeveloping off the west coast and then how the precipitation plays out as it heads up the east coast because there are some places here that do need this rain in a big way but this is really going to slow down any sort of planting and fieldwork progress we have over here I'm thinking about cotton all the way up you know to, to corn soybeans all sorts of crops tobacco we grow a lot of stuff here along the east coast into new england so just want to keep an eye on that the story's in the pattern all right and we're going to watch a few things. Watch for broader troughs to develop here as this omega pattern still remains. Watch for this trough to swing down and support additional rainfall coming through the areas that desperately need it in the plains. And then keep an eye on the big ridge that builds across the west as I play through the remainder of this week into the weekend. So here's the trough that dives down. This is the next one that we're going to keep an eye on. That's the severe weather threat one we're talking about in Texas um, in, in two days. And then you see the colder air coming back around here, April 30th, getting into May 1st and 2nd. That's our frost threat. But the heat is building in the west. But notice by May 1st, May 2nd, one trough. Look at this. This is such a highly amplified pattern. It is bunched up. And the bunching is all here. That's what's slowing all of this down. But we are going to see things kind of smooth out and open up. And now getting to May 2nd, the coldest air centered around the eastern Great Lakes into New England. Trough redevelops off the west coast, and that's what's going to introduce more precipitation and cooler weather to California. And Big Ridge broadens out. Now this ridge is going to return quite a bit of heat to the Canadian Prairie, Montana, the Northern Plains, down into the Central Plains, and eventually into the Midwest. This is a snow melting ridge. Whatever is left in this area is going to get melted pretty quickly here. And what we notice is that playing out through about May 8th and 9th and then heading out there into that week that leads up to Mother's Day, you know, the pattern is suggesting mild air moving back into the central U.S. with the East Coast being the last holdout for colder weather. All right, let's see how this all plays out by going first to the high-res models. This is this morning, so we're still watching this area down here. There is a severe thunderstorm watch out ahead of these storms. And as those storms kind of continue to curl up around this low, moving over Mississippi into Alabama midday today, rain north of it. There's a little almost like clipper-like frontal boundary that's moving through Ontario into the Great Lakes. And here's that next trough I was mentioning. So we're going to watch one exit. So this guy goes here. This one dives south. 
and this is 8 o'clock tonight, playing through the day on Friday, and then getting out here to Friday evening. So remember, this is where we're going to watch for the strong to severe storms to show up, and we're going to watch that next low curl. Now remember, at this point, the deeper trough is developing here. The trough to the south will pivot around it, and one is exiting. Those are those three systems. And all along, the ridge is building in the western United States. So we take a look at what this does toward precipitation, and this is what the latest from the WPC suggests. So we are wettest in this corridor and then wrapping around this low that's going to be over the eastern Great Lakes. Here's your drier corridor. Let's look at both the GFS and the European to see how this all plays out. So we've seen through the next 60 hours or so. So let's pick it up here Saturday morning, getting it Saturday midday and Saturday evening. So a cold and wetter one in and around the Great Lakes and also down in the south. So from here, as we play into Sunday, watch the surge of moisture come into the Carolinas, pressing through Virginia, Maryland. They need this moisture. Deeper cold tucked away in this trough here. And we'll take a look at the risk of the snow in a few moments. But this is going to produce, just watch the European here carefully. This is Sunday into Monday. Cloudy, cold, soggy all throughout this area. This is that risk of the colder conditions, you know, through, through May 1st and into the morning on May 2nd. And then after that, that moves. It's out. It moves toward the east coast. Trough digs into the west. And now we start to see a whole new pattern showing up with the flow coming back like this. And what this is possibly going to do is increase the risk of severe storms in this area. But this is going to be after we get past like the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, that time frame. So we look out there and say, what's the probability of getting at least an inch of liquid out of this? Very high probabilities along the east coast but they're also increasing over here in California. So south, east coast, Ontario, eastern Great Lakes, probability of two inches, very high in this region. So there is some drought in this area that needs to correct it, and this is going to be good overall for that. But I cannot rule out the risk of some snow here in Ontario, parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, the UP, and also still in the spine of the Rockies. And now we see the increased risk over here in the Sierra Nevada. Okay, let's now move on to the week two outlook. Because we're going to watch that trough exit, there's still a drier signal here for most of week two. But we're going to be seeing this chance of precip increase in California. It's in all three models. And then build into the plains and eventually into the Midwest as we progress through the beginning of the month of May. Right now, though, the coldest conditions are tucked away here compared to average. And really with respect to a frost risk this morning, severe thunderstorm watch to the south, dense fog north. And this is an avalanche advisory when all of the shading of color that you see over here represents either hydrologic outlook or flooding risk. And that's what we're going to be dealing with in the West. Temperatures, take a look at the frost risk over the next seven days. Most of this is this morning. Okay. We're starting to see that behind this next system, the coldest conditions could be here. And then I think we're going to just knock all of this out quickly as we get out there past May 1st, 2nd, 3rd. All right. Let's take a look at what the high temperatures are going to do. This is today's high temperatures on Thursday, very mild in this area, but that won't last too long into the weekend. While the heat builds into the west, look at this 90s stretching from you know Southern California all the way up to Oregon. We're going to watch on Friday the temperatures really transition into the weekend cool shot behind that low that's developing. So there's Sunday's high temperatures, heat west, cold around the Midwest, presses east on Monday, but then watch the mild air begin to just push out next Wednesday. This is going to be a major, major push forward on getting a crop established in this area because we're starting to see the reduced risk of major frost events after that date. Okay, keep an eye on that. Over the next seven days, this is our newest GDD map. We now have positive numbers here. We're starting to see the heat coming back in. We need to get these numbers up in the 70s. I mean, that would be normal for this time of year uh, to see the GDDs accumulate, but we're going to watch those numbers really start to pop up. Last couple things, just want to show you this is the latest 15-day outlook on temperatures as a five-day sliding window. That's day five through 10. Remember, at this point, the troughs are reestablishing here. The ridge is opening up in the midsection of the country, and the trough that's over the east is exiting east. So from day five through 10 on, the last holdout for the colder weather will be the eastern part of the United States. This is the significant warm-up, though. We're talking about Canadian prairie, central United States, and Midwest. In tonight's video, we'll be covering some quite important things. The bomb just released. That's the Bureau of Meteorology. They just released their newest outlook for um, El Nino, and they've gone back over to 
very high values, 2.8 C. We're going to compare this to historical El Nino events, and you'll see that this could be a record setter if their forecasting is correct. But that's what we're going to be discussing. We're going to talk about these ocean temperatures in the Atlantic compared to what's going on in the Pacific and what this negative PDO signal could mean looking at longer range. And finally, we will cover some international weather as well. I just want to remind you that right now it's hot and very dry throughout the Iberian Peninsula, very hot in uh, Kazakhstan and this part of Russia, but we're colder tucked in here from Ukraine and over here uh, in this part of Europe. So we'll watch all of this tonight in the in-depth report. Until then, have a good rest of your day. Thank you.